Discovering that your live stream looks like it's been sliced up like a loaf of bread after you've upgraded to a dual PC streaming setup and expected things to look amazeballs or upgraded to the next generation console to run things at 120 hertz isn't fun. It, it, it really sucks when you think you're making a big investment for the quality of your production and it ends up looking worse. This is a very common problem among all dual PC streamers. And even if you don't think you struggle from it, you probably do because I rarely see a dual PC stream that's set up with capture cards that doesn't struggle from this. But I'm here to tell you that the era of screen tearing in live streams is coming to an end. This video is sponsored by Hover. Find out how you can save on your new online home with a awesome dot stream domain extension at the end of the video. Screen tearing or the look of your video feed being torn or sliced into different chunks that aren't aligned properly with each other is the result of video frames not being in sync when they're pushed out to a display or a capture card in this case. This is very common in PC gaming. This is why adaptive sync or variable refresh rate or G-Sync or free sync became popular because it's a technology that syncs up your monitor with the frame rate of your video game so that they're you know in sync with whatever frame you're outputting that's the frame the monitor is getting and out and displaying to you that way it doesn't tear because otherwise if the frames get out of sync with say your game's running at a fluctuating frame rate and it sends one frame and your monitor displays it and then it sends another one and while that monitor's trying to load that one it sends another or it only gets half of it or something you start ending up with tearing on your screen now this is actually less noticeable on your actual display than it might be in and say a capture card when you're live streaming. This is a huge problem in dual PC streaming setups is there are plenty of gamers who think that they don't have any screen tearing at all. And the second they introduce a capture card, it's everywhere. And realistically, there aren't a whole lot of fixes for it with standard dual PC capture card setups. You either need to get lucky and just happen to hit your target refresh rate with your frame rate and things happen to be in sync, which can disappear just from relaunches of your game or reboots or whatever or you can force it with V-Sync. V-Sync is pretty much the only fix that is guaranteed to work. There are other solutions. NVIDIA Fast Sync or AMD's equivalent can help, but it's not a guarantee. And certain games, even with all those things involved, still just end up with a Terry mess. But we now have two capture cards because one just got an update for it that allow you to use variable refresh rate when you're live streaming and it's pretty cool. A month or so ago, I reviewed Elgato's new HD60X capture card, which supports variable refresh rate from the Xbox, now the PlayStation 5, which just got a VRR update, as well as PC, as long as you're not trying to use G-Sync. Well, the EVGA XR1 Pro, which I reviewed a little bit earlier than that, just got an update that stabilizes that as well. You might actually remember from my review of the XR1 Pro that I was discovering that I was kind of able to send VRR signals to this already, uh, even though it wasn't supposed to be officially supported. And EVGA took that as, it's not a bug, it's a feature, and got it patched up because I was having a ton of frame pacing issues. But frame pacing isn't totally fixed here. And we're gonna talk about what that means for you but that's not even this capture card's fault. We're entering a new kind of paradigm shift of the problems that streamers will face with displays and variable re refresh rate or adaptive sync is actually to blame here. So I already covered the Elgato HD60X in its own review. Go check that out. We're covering the update to the XR1 primarily here while I talk about the bigger picture implications and what things will look like moving forward. To test out the new update to the XR1 Pro, I went ahead and grabbed a handful of supported games on all platforms, PC, Xbox, and PlayStation to see, you know, what the variable refresh rate experience is like. I'm doing my console testing on my LG CX OLED, so perfectly compatible there, works great. You'll notice in the firmware patches for the XR1 Pro that it says support added support for HDMI 2.1 VRR. This doesn't mean that it's gonna support HDMI 2.1, you know, higher bandwidth signals. This won't support 4K 120, 1440p 240, or anything like that. The only reason it specifies HDMI 2.1 there is because HDMI 2.1 as a standard adds official uh, HDMI forum support for variable refresh rate that isn't tied to a specific manufacturer. So for example, the uh, uh, Xbox One X as well as the Xbox Series X and Series S use AMD FreeSync if available as an option. And then of course your PC can use FreeSync or G-Sync, but the PlayStation just uses the normal HDMI 2.1 based VRR implementation. And so that's what this supports. It also supports FreeSync as well. But that's where that 
firmware indicator might confuse people. So PlayStation 5 supports this right out of the box, no problem. Plug it in, hook it up to my TV, works great. Uh, it's worth noting here, if you haven't messed with it yet, the VRR range for the PlayStation 5 is 48 hertz to 120 hertz. So you only have that room to play with. What this means for VRR ranges and all displays and all capture devices and whatever have limited VRR ranges. What this means is that if you go below this range, so for the PlayStation 5, if your game dips below 48 hertz, VRR will get disabled and then you're gonna have some weird pacing issues or screen tearing again. Um, however, if you stay in that range, you're good to go and you're not gonna have screen tearing. The same thing applies to use with this capture card. In all the games that I tested, as long as you stay within the VRR range, you don't get any screen tearing, which is absolutely glorious to see in a live stream. I am so stoked for this future. However, there is a caveat. So if, as I mentioned before, if you go below the VRR range, then VRR gets disabled and you can run into some juttery frames or screen tearing or whatever that applies to everything. However, if you go below 60 FPS in general, you're going to have duplicate frames because you're probably streaming at 60 FPS. And if you dip below that, it's not magic. It's not making up new frames. You're going to show some jutter. Plugging it into the Xbox Series X. Again, works out of the box. Just got to toggle it. Good to go. Tested Master Chief Collection. Had a rock solid 118 to 120 uh, hertz and looked phenomenal. Super silky smooth. However, there are games that don't hold a locked frame rate. And that's where things get kind of funky here. And I'm kind of issuing a minor correction because part of me was holding the Elgato HD60X accountable for some of this. And I'm now kind of changing course to this is a problem we have to solve moving forward for VRR supported capture cards. You see games that run completely rock solid with zero variants are generally not gonna give you any problems. So the Master Chief Collection on Xbox Series X running at 1440p 120 in VRR mode it did not budge at all, and the video looks great. However, Spider-Man Miles Morales, which did get an update from Insomniac to more thoroughly support VRR, which is great. I love that Insomniac is always pushing all of the new display standards as best as possible. It doesn't look super hot, even though it's staying above 60 FPS. We still get some duplicate frames, and it still doesn't look super silky smooth. What's going on here? While VRR pass-through works, to your display and it's able to communicate with your display and make sure your display stays in sync with your game feed on your console or your PC and that works great. The capture hardware and your capture feed in general is not really VRR compatible. A variable frame rate as a media encoding format exists. Uh, most phones actually record to VFR so it's not a locks, locked you know, frame rate and anyone who's tried editing that in a, you know, Resolve or Premiere or whatever have found the pitfalls of that because audio sync is a nightmare. But in general, a video feed, a video stream is a locked constant frame rate. It doesn't fluctuate. You know, you can't really, you technically can, but in an ideal world, you're not fluctuating that over time like VRR does, which means that you, the, the, the two streams of video, the video that you're passing through to your TV and the video you're capturing to your computer aren't perfect. What has to happen is that the hardware in the capture cart has to sample a frame to then deliver to your OBS or whatever at a certain rate. And that kind of needs to stay static just for ideal scenarios in general. So what you end up having is if you have a game like Spider-Man Miles Morales, which if you put into specifically in my testing, because I wanted to test the VRR mode extensively, I put it into performance RT mode at 1080p 120, which means it's trying to run at 120 Hertz with ray tracing but in performance mode to get above 60 FPS. So what the capture hardware in the capture card sees is a 120 Hertz signal. And so it's trying to sample that frame every, you know, basically half of the rate, every 16.67 milliseconds to get you a clean 60 FPS feed. Every once in a while, even with a locked, you know, V-Sync 120 Hertz signal, you can still get frame pacing issues with that just in general. But overall, that's generally the right way to go. But with VRR on, Spider-Man Miles Morales in this mode runs between 60 and 120 FPS and it's bouncing all over the place. I saw frame rates in the 60s, frame rates in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, every once in a while at 100 or so, which means that in a 120 Hertz feed, the frame rate is not always an even double of 60 Hertz. Sometimes you got duplicate frames if you're sampling it down the sampling is still going to have duplicate frames, even if you're above 60 FPS in your game. And I know that's a little counterintuitive or confusing, but that just comes down to the way that the capture hardware samples the frame rate from 
the video feed because it's not doing so in a variable fashion because that would still end up with gnarly results even when you have a locked, you know, 120 hertz or 60 hertz or whatever. This is the issue that I encountered with the HD60X because in other games that I tested, even ones that appear to run relatively locked at 120 hertz, such as Warzone on the Xbox Series X or Black Ops Cold War on the PlayStation 5, we're still not getting a perfectly silky smooth 60 FPS. It still looks, you know, if you've ever seen the people who file support tickets in OBS or talk about on Twitch where it's like, it says it's 60 FPS, there's no dropped frames, but it doesn't look like a perfect 60 FPS. This is what's happening. The frame pacing, the timing of your frames are not an even 16.67 millisecond interval. They are fluctuating all over the place because that's how variable refresh rate works. And thus the sampling of it isn't going to give you a perfect result. Now, I would argue that it's fine. Most viewers aren't going to notice or take care unless it gets really bad, you know, if you get below 60 or whatever. But it's a lot better than the screen tearing that you could get otherwise. Because there have been plenty of streamers where they're like, oh, I use dual PC with a capture card. I don't get screen tearing at all. What's your deal? And then I go to their stream and they got like, they're forcing a refresh rate that their capture card doesn't support. And they got like eight or nine different screen tears going down their screen. And it just looks like visual vomit to me. That people will notice, that people will care about a lot more. Over on the PC side, things get a little complicated and confusing, and I'm once again shining the spotlight on NVIDIA here to get their poop together to fix this, because there's nothing stopping these capture cards from working with PC setups, and if you use an AMD graphics card as your gaming PC, then you're gonna have no problem passing FreeSync through using the XR1 Pro or the Elgato HD60X. But if you're an NVIDIA user hoping to use G-Sync or G-Sync compatible, you can't do this because G-Sync compatible, other than on specific TVs, you know, super edge cases, G-Sync and G-Sync compatible only works over DisplayPort. That's it. So I was able to test using my ultra wide. I just set it to 16 by 9, 1440p, 100 hertz, and cloned it out to the XR1 Pro. And I was able to capture a game without screen tearing by turning on G-Sync once I had cloned, but that's not a guarantee. I tried another game where the performance was a little bit more fluctuating, and it was just a teary, stuttery mess. Moving over to my Samsung Odyssey G7, which is a 1440p 240Hz monitor, figured I'd just knock it down to 144Hz or 120Hz mode and try passing the, you know, cable through, and suddenly my graphics card doesn't even know that the monitor supports G-Sync compatible, because it doesn't support it over HDMI. I tried setting up cloning and I was able to clone 1440p 240 to my display and then just downscale it, you know, force it through Windows or through NVIDIA control panel to the capture card. But of course that ended up being a, you know, screen Terry mess because it's not the refresh rate the capture card supports. And so it's inherently getting basically pushed two frames at a time when it's supposed to only be accepting one because it's only accepting things at a rate of 120 hertz instead of 240. So it's literally trying to sample groups of two frames as one frame and that's where a lot of the tearing comes from so the fact that we now have two capture cards that support vrr in any fashion is absolutely huge but we need nvidia to step up to the plate and start allowing for g-sync and g-sync compatible support over hdmi i know nvidia has had interest in working with capture card companies to get capture cards g-sync certified but until the monitors themselves can work with g-sync over hdmi the capture cards can't really do anything about it and that's really frustrating. Also, while producing this video, the Asus TUF CU4K30 got a firmware update that enables VRR support as well. It's outside of the scope of this video since it's all pretty much already done, but join us on Discord at discord.gg slash evilsvox to stay up to date with the news on this, as well as to get any thoughts I may have once I start testing. The fact that we have two capture cards supporting this means positive momentum is in the right direction, and once I still think we're looking at 2023 before we get, or later, before we get actual HDMI 2.1 capture cards that do 4K 120, 1440p 240, 1080p 360, anything like that. And hopefully NVIDIA and the capture card companies can figure this out by time we get to that point. Because we are at the point where there's going to be basically no excuse for screen tearing in your streams when capture cards are starting to support it. And I'm super stoked for that. I just really hope NVIDIA can help get us the final 10% there on the PC side. But if you have a console, you're going to be able to play in VRR on your TV. You're going to be able to play in 4K or 1440p, 120 hertz, 4K, 60 hertz, and game, and it's going to look awesome, and you're not going to get screen tearing for your stream, which is great. 
I still don't think either of these capture cards do a particularly great job at HDR tone mapping, and that's kind of disappointing. But at this point, I find HDR in general to just be so much of a crapshoot that I'm, I'm struggling to find it to be worth it. But hopefully we can see some positive momentum on that front because I'm going to be showing you how to stream HDR and HEVC finally with OBS very soon. So get subscribed for that because that combined with these VRR capture cards means you're going to be able to take your stream to the next level. If you're going through all this trouble to build the best live stream possible, you know, to take it to the next level, then you need a website to send people to either for more content from you to buy things from you so you can build a more sustainable business model or just for potential sponsors to reach out to you. Hell, if you get a cool domain name, you can just use it for email without even having a website. They have email services too, and it's much more professional if you're reaching out to a would-be sponsor or even another creator for a collab to have your own domain email rather than Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo. Did you know that dot .stream is actually a domain extension? It's perfect, right? .stream, .live, over 400 domain extensions are available with Hover. And in fact, I was using Hover to grab the perfect custom domain for my Etsy shop, which was analogdreams.shop. And it took me like five minutes at most to get set up and forwarded to Etsy with far less work than any other domain provider I have used before. It was super simple and they allow you to really just kind of you know, if, if if the exact domain you want isn't available, then it'll suggest alternatives for you so you can find the exact combination that you want, and it just gets out of your way. No trying to force you into a specific package or plan, they're just trying to get you what you want as quickly and easily as possible. For the absolute easiest domain buying experience that doesn't get in your way and award-winning customer support, head on over to hover.com slash eposfox and get 10% off of your new online home. Let me know what cool websites you build to promote your stream, because I think that's an underrated value that stream kind of pass over all the time. If you use variable refresh rate in your live streams, let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, be kind, rewind.